Well, good morning, Vertical Church family. I'm Pastor Ken, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church, and thank you all for tuning in online. Is you all aware of what's going on in our nation right now? I just wanted to talk to us for a few moments because the church is not a building. We are the people of God. We're the ones that have been called out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And it's important with all that's happening now in our land, more than ever, that we arise to these challenges and remember the scriptures tell us that darkness would cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Bible's injunction to us is to arise and shine. For the light has come and the glory of the Lord is arisen upon us. And that's why I want us as a congregation to recognize that we should exercise the cautions and precautions that they are recommending in culture. But at the same time, not allow fear to grip your heart. It's important to be wise and to be led by the Spirit, but at the same time, don't let all that's going on around you get inside of you where you begin to fear or you begin to forget that the Lord our God is mighty to save. Jesus told us that in the world we would have troubles, but not to fear. Why? Because he has overcome the world. And that's why it's important. In fact, I've told you all, in Psalm 91 it tells us, he who abides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. In Him do I trust. That's what my encouragement to you is, church family, is that we keep God's Word in the center of our heart and speak it from our mouths that God is the one we trust. He is our refuge and our fortress. And I just, I just want to take this moment also to encourage you because I believe that during these times is when the church can shine the brightest. We have organized through our outreach efforts opportunities right now to arise and meet the needs within our community. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can reach us at, out, at outreach at vertical. Dot com, outreach at vertical.com. You can email us and say, hey, listen, I'd like to be a part of that team because we've recognized some at-risk groups within our communities where we believe we can be a blessing. Why does God bless us, church? What do we say all the time? God blesses us to be a blessing. And it's in these times right now that we can demonstrate who we are in Christ because we realize that we're here for such a time as this, that the spirit of the living God lives inside of us, and we want to arise to help meet challenges and to be a part of that. So if you're confident in that end, you'd like to be a part of that, reach out to us via email and let us know. We're organizing around. We realize that one of the most at-risk groups right now is our seniors' population. And so whether at our food pantry at Outwater or some of the things right here in the city of West Haven, we're going to be organizing around these times. And it's a chance to show that we, the church, are the body of Christ. We can be the hands and feet of Jesus to our community in such real and abiding ways. But guys, before I get into the message this morning, I'm grateful that in our nation we have recognized the need to pray. The President of the United States, whether you realize it or not, issued today as a national day of prayer. And I wanted to read for us the proclamation that was made from the White House regarding this. And then we're going to pray together. But listen to this. It says, In our times of greatest need, Americans have always turned to prayer to help guide us through the trials and periods of uncertainty. As we continue to face the unique challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic, Millions of Americans are unable to gather in their churches, temples, synagogues, mosques, and house of worship. But in this time, we must not cease asking God for added wisdom, comfort, and strength. And we must especially pray for those who have suffered harm or who have lost loved ones. I ask you to join me in a day of prayer for all people who have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic and to pray for God's healing hand to be placed on the people of our nation. As your president, I ask you to pray for the health and well-being of your fellow Americans and to remember that no problem is too big for God to handle. We should all take to heart the words found in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all of your care on him, for he careth for you. Let us pray for those affected by the virus, that they will feel the presence of the Lord's protection and love during this time. With God's help, we will overcome this threat. On Friday, I declared a national emergency and took the bold actions to help 
deploy the full power of the federal government to assist the efforts to combat the coronavirus pandemic. I now encourage Americans to pray for those on the front lines of the response, especially for our nation's outstanding medical care professionals, public health officials who are working tirelessly to protect us all from the coronavirus threat that it, and the patients that it has been infected by. All of the courageous first responders, our National Guard, dedicated individuals who are working to ensure the health and safety of our communities. For our federal, state, and local leaders, we are confident that we will provide with them the window that they need to make difficult decisions and take de decisive actions to protect Americans all across the country. As we come to our Father in prayer, we remember the words found in Psalm 91, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. As we unite in prayer, we are reminded that there is no burden too heavy for God to lift, for our country to bear with his help. Luke, said, Luke 137 promises, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. And those words are just as true today as they have ever been. As our nation, one nation, under God, we are greater than the hardships we face, and through prayer and actions of compassion and love, we rise to this challenge and emerge stronger and more united than ever before. May God bless each of you, and may God bless the United States of America. Let us all join together as we pray right now. Bow your heads with me right wherever you are at. Heavenly Father, we come boldly to the throne of grace to seek your mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We humble ourselves as a nation and recognize that without you, Lord God, that the problems we face would be bigger. But Lord, through you, we can do all things. We trust and believe that you are the one that opens up the wisdom and knowledge that we need. We ask that you would move right now among our medical professionals, our scientists, and all that is necessary to give wisdom and instruction of how we can combat this challenge that we face not only in our nation, but in our world. Almighty God, we turn to you in humility and ask that your grace would be poured out upon us. To all of those who have suffered under this situation, we ask that your healing power would be to them strong. To those who have suffered loss, that you would comfort them in their times of need. We ask that you would give courage and strength and boldness to our medical professionals, to our first responders, and to all that are responding in our nation to this challenge. Guide them and direct them. Protect them and keep them. And Lord... May you bring peace upon our nation. As we, your believers, turn to you, we recognize that you are more than enough. That no challenge is greater than our great God. And so we humbly seek you in these moments. We ask you to pour out your spirit upon this nation. We ask you to keep us and provide for us and guide us in the way forward. What the enemy has attempted to do for evil, Lord, we ask you to turn it for good. That many would know and understand the goodness and grace of the great God who loves us and has shown your love for us by sending your one and only Son into this world. Thank you, Almighty God. It's in times like this that our hearts trust in you the most. We love you and thank you that your ear is open to our prayers and that your hand is strong to move in the midst of our challenges. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, today I'm excited because we have a, a word that I want to share with you today that I think is so apropos. It's just like the Holy Spirit. We started into a series on calling eyewitness because it is the eyewitness account of the life of the Apostle John, who as a young man had met Jesus. And through what he experienced, through what he saw, came to believe in who Jesus was. And as an old man penned down for us these things that he had come to believe and understand, that he wanted us to understand and know. John said the reason he wrote what he wrote is that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and by believing, we would experience life in his name. And I believe it's just as apropos today. And so John gave seven signs that pointed to what he believed bore the identity of Jesus. And that is my hope that all of us would come to know Jesus in a greater way than we ever have before. If we haven't fully put our trust in him, that through this series, as I've encouraged all of you to read along with me the Gospel of John, that you would come to know Jesus and place your trust in him. 
that if you do know him already, that you would come to love him even more and trust in him even greater, that you would follow him no matter what the circumstances of life present to you. And so today, we're going to be looking at something important, but this is the question that I have. Have any of you ever been affected by religious rules or regulations that seem to prohibit you or get in the way from you experiencing God? Or maybe, have religious rules or regulations ever been a means that have hurt you or have kept you from the things of God? Two personal stories for you today as we begin. The first one deals with my parents. My mother was an immigrant Italian who moved to the United States, but my parents met during World War II. My mother was a nurse, and my father was in the Air Force. And they met at a USO dance, and they decided to marry. Now, my mom was a Catholic, but my dad was not. My dad was a hillbilly from West Virginia, really didn't know much about faith. But my parents decided to marry. And in their marriage, what ended up happening was my mother was excommunicated from the church. Now, maybe you don't know or understand much, but to an immigrant Italian family, that's huge. And that was a poor point of shame and disgrace. And my parents had to go through a whole host of things before they could ever get back into the good graces of the church and be restored in that end. Now, I, this was well before I ever came along, but when I realized that, I realized how many times have people been affected by and turned away from the church when it should be a place where they should find safety and refuge. Now, the other one is also a personal relative of mine, someone close to me, that when going through a divorce, they were a deacon within their church. And when the determination that they was going to be divorced, they were taken aside and told that they would no longer be allowed to serve within the church community because they would be divorced. And here's my question for all of us. Has ever our attempt to be true to the text actually hurt the people that the text was supposed to help? You see, what amazes me is this. When we study the Gospel of John, John makes this bold declaration that when we see Jesus, we see God in a bod. We see God manifested in human form. And so the Bible tells us, John said, that no one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son who is close to the Father has come to make him known. What amazed me is this. The people who had the most difficulty dealing with Jesus while he was on the earth, amazingly, were religious leaders. You ever ask the question, what makes God mad? Human beings have a lot of answers to that question. But I'm talking about what does actually Scripture say? When you look at Jesus you discover that to know God is to see Jesus. And I love this aspect of it. When you actually look at it, it may not be anything you ever thought before. Mark's gospel tells us this, that when Jesus had come into the synagogue one day, there was a man there who had a withered hand. But the day in which Jesus was speaking happened to be a Sabbath day. And there were religious leaders watching whether or not he would heal on the Sabbath day. And Mark's account says this, that Jesus looked upon them with anger. What made Jesus angry? And here's the point that you need to recognize. Whenever religious rules, whenever religious leaders get in the way of the mercy and grace helping the people to whom it was given for, that makes God angry. In fact, when Jesus, probably the most... The time that he went the most uh, 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 nitro on this end, when he came to Jerusalem. And he went into the temple. And he overturned the money changers and casted all the people. He gave us the reason why he was upset. He said, my father's house is a place of prayer for all nations. But you've turned it into a place as a den of thieves. In other words, the people who were coming there earnestly to seek God, their sacrifices were being determined. No, 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 that's not acceptable. The money changed. It became a profiting situation. In essence, God's house should never be a place that people are prohibited from receiving the mercy and the grace that God came to provide for us. 
And so today we're going to look at this because here's the point. The story we're going to look at, the title of today's message is called Lame Excuses. Because sometimes barriers can be created, whether for ourselves personally or mother in other circumstances or situations that we think are God, but maybe necessarily they're not. So if you're following along, and this is found in John's Gospel, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, this is happening, it says this, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, which in the Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches. And in these, a great crowd of invalids, blind and lame and paralyzed. Notice what he's pointing out to you. John is telling us that this is a situation where people who were in desperate need had come. You ever notice that many times people who are in the same situation tend to congregate together? And here these people were waiting, and in their desperation, there was almost a sense of hopelessness, but there was a sense of hope because look at here. They were waiting for the moving of the water, verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred the water. And after the stirring of the water, whoever stepped into the what first was healed of whatever disease they had. Let's stop for a moment there in verse 4. Some commentators will try to say, well, this really didn't happen. This, some, some translations, it doesn't include this end of it. But what we're going to discover is the man's response to Jesus means that there had to be some credibility in what was going down. And whether or not this, what we need to recognize, I remember this line from the movie, The Hunger Games, that the only thing more powerful than fear is hope. And that's what we need to remember in this time right now, because our hope rests purely in God. And so in these people were gathering because their hope rested on this situation. They were desperate. And they were waiting for this concern. Now look at verse 5. And a certain man was there who had been in this illness for 38 years. Let that sink in for a moment. They had been in the situation that they were facing for 38 years. That's a long time. This man had dealt with this particular illness for a very, very long, long time. Now look at verse 6. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition now a long time. In other words, Jesus, probably by a gift of the Spirit, what we call as the word of knowledge. Jesus knew and understood this man had been in this situation for a very long time. So the way in which Jesus approaches this is brilliant. Because one of the most powerful tools that you and I have is the ability to ask questions. And why is questions such a powerful tool? Because questions reveal things. So you don't know necessarily what is someone else's mindset, someone else's certain condition. Asking questions can be very, very revealing. And so here, in essence, Jesus knew he'd been in this situation for a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now, seemingly this would... This would almost appear like it's a ridiculous question. But here's the thing I want to ask all of us today. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be changed? Do you want your situation to be better? And why ask the question? Because all of us would naturally say yes, but listen. Years of experience, I've been in counseling situations, and you start talking to someone, and you say, would you want your situation to be better? And all of a sudden, you're, you're faced with so many challenges, so many answers. Well, if my spouse, or if my children, or if my boss, or if my... And there are so many reasons and rationales as to why there are obstacles in the way of their situation being better. In other words, doctors... People go and they say, and the doctor will say to you, would you like your situation to be better? I think it would be good for you to lose some weight. I think it would be good for you to do some exercise. And people have all of the rationale, all of the reason, and the question we have to ask, and that's the question I want to ask all of us today. Do you want to be better? You see, sometimes we want our financial situations to be better. 
We encourage people to take FPU at our church because Dave Ramsey's method is proven. But the issue is this, do you want to be better? Because many times that will make you face the issues of your spending habits or other issues that you have to deal with in life. And you have to ask the question, do I really want to be better? Do I want my condition to change? Sometimes in our career, somebody can pull us aside and say, hey, listen, you want to get ahead? Let me point out something. Maybe you don't realize it, like make being on time, you know, doing your best. Some of the little things, there's little habits that I'm noticing that if you deal with those, they really can be catapults to move you ahead. And we have to ask the question, are we ready? Because Jesus asked this man a question. And notice his response. The, man, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming down, another steps down before me. So in essence, the man had the reason and the rationale why his situation wasn't going to be better. And this is a point that I want you to understand. Excuses are reasons not to believe. Excuses are always reasons not to believe. And many of us have reasons why. The situation's not going to change. Many of us, because sometimes having to overcome issues, see, in this particular man's life, he was in this situation for 38 years. I have no idea how that would be. But getting over, his biggest hurdle was getting over his past. And sometimes our ability to move forward is dealing with our discouragement, dealing with the issues we've dealt with before, dealing with the things that says, I've tried that, I've done that, I've walked through that. And we have reasons why the situation won't be better. Because beliefs, our excuses really reveal for us many things that we believe. And our beliefs govern our behaviors. Our beliefs act as filters as to why not. Many times we'll hear something. We, we, we recognize that maybe God wants our situation to change, but we start to filter it through all of our past experiences. Sometimes we have to deal with what others have said, what others have experienced in our lives, what, what situations that we have faced before. And sometimes facing those areas, we have to be willing to say, am I willing, listen, to do? Whatever Jesus says, do. Because who is Jesus? That's what I want through the course of this series for us to come to the realization of. Who is Jesus to us personally? Because Jesus experienced that when he went to his own hometown in Nazareth. And he got up on the day and spoke in his synagogue. Those people had every, you know, they, they were struggling with the ability to see him in the role of Messiah because they had known him as the carpenter's son. They had known him in a different setting. And now they're like, where did he get these gracious words? How could he say that this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing? When he read from the book of Isaiah. And they had every rationale and reason why it could not be true. And then Jesus, in a provocative way, said, Do you not think that there were many widows in Israel during the times of Elijah the prophet? But he was only sent to Zarepta, to that one widow. And if you know anything about the biblical story, when Elijah came to the widow, he asked her to do something that was totally non-intuitive. It seemed to be almost heartless because there was famine in the land and she had just enough to make a meal for her and her son and in her, in her thoughts, eat it and then after that die because there was no more. And Elijah comes with, a, with something that seems to be so provocative. He says, make something for me first. And then for yourselves. Well, if you know the Bible, you know that the answer was God met her at her need. God provided supernaturally. But it always requires of us a response first to what God says. We wait on whether or not we agree. We wait on God to do something. But the issue is, will we do what God says do when God says do it? Why? Because he's God. And the question that we ask in this series is, who is Jesus to me personally? And so in essence, because Jesus went on to say, were there not many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha, the prophet? But why was only Naaman healed? And Naaman, if you know anything about this story, Naaman almost was not healed. Because he didn't want to do what the prophet had told him to do because it didn't fit into what he thought he would be asked to do. 
But eventually he went and did exactly what he was asked to do. Dip seven times in the Jordan River and he was healed. And many times we have to ask the question, are we willing to do what Jesus says do when Jesus says do it? Or do we have excuses? Because look at what Jesus says to the man. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. That seems ridiculous. This man had been in this situation for 38 years. He's not talking about getting in the water. That's why he was there. That was his one hope, that he could get into the water. Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, I'll get you in before anybody else. No, he told him what? Rise, take up your bed and walk. And look what happened. And immediately the man was healed and took up his bed and walked. That day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, what's interesting here is this. Actually, the law of God had nothing, this, this had nothing to do. This man carrying his bed was not a violation of the Sabbath according to the law of Moses. You see, man-made rules, man-made conditions, man-made interpretations to what God said can totally, totally get us off. And that's what we struggle with most of the time. And so in essence, they told him, it's not lawful for you to do so. And then verse 11, and he answered them, he who healed me said to me, take up your bed and walk. And so they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you've become whole. Sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. So in essence, if you take this in point, what was the issue here that they were struggling with? And why did the religious community immediately reject Jesus for what he had done in this moment? Because this is what John points out for us. It happened on the Sabbath. And important for us to understand is that God's ways will never obstruct or never keep us from compassion. You see, you and I need to recognize that the compassion, doing God's ways are never in opposition to compassion. If you ever are, are, feel led because of what something you think the Bible says keeps you from acting in compassion, God is love. And whatever we do, if it's not love, it's not God. See here, the religious community at this particular point were trying to say that no, you can't be healed on the Sabbath day. And Jesus attempted to call out the community at this. When we read the Gospels, you recognize Jesus asked religious leaders at points. He said, which of you, if you had an ox or a donkey that fell into a hole on the Sabbath day, would not get it out? What he was trying to point out is, do we actually care more about animals than we do about human beings who are made in the image and the likeness of God? Jesus attempted to point this out to the religious community at the time when he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You see, what they had misunderstood. What was the rule of the Sabbath? Whatever you normally did for your occupation, God's saying, take a day off and don't do it seven days a week. Remember that everything you have comes as a gift from God. Your ability to make your income, the ability to have what you are, it's a day of celebration. It's a day of reflection. It's a day of recognizing the need for rest in the human body. That God said that we were to suspend our normal work routine one day out of seven. That was the rule of the Sabbath. But just like everything else in life, sometimes we can make the things of God really complicated. And we can miss out because here's the point. Here, here's something. Here. We miss the point, and it's important to recognize. We miss the point when we don't know the why for the what. We miss the point. The, in other words, why did God provide that? Because what we need to recognize is that man wasn't created. Jesus said it this way. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. 
And we struggle sometimes as human beings because we, we tend to, to mix up and get tripped up by God's law. And sometimes we realize that God, man wasn't created to obey laws. Laws came along to aid and to help humankind. But whenever we see a law as an obstruction, we miss the point. We miss the realization, why did God provide this end? Why does God provide any aspect of instruction for us as his people? Because he always has something more in mind. And when you, when you don't know the why, you can miss the point with the what. In other words, when you try to, and that's something that the church has been highly, highly guilty of at times. And the rest of the discourse here in John chapter 5 deals with religious leaders and their inability to understand or to know who Jesus is. And that's where I want to turn the point of this conversation because here's the issue. In each of our lives, the question that we need to ask ourselves, do you want to be better? Because what you need to realize out of this story is that Jesus is always ready to get involved. But he will always provide an instruction. And it's your obedience to the instruction because of who he is that releases the power of God to bring change into your life. You have to ask the question, do I want to be better? Because are you willing to do whatever Jesus says? But the other question where I want to turn the conversation this morning is this. Is us as followers of God, have we actually at times gotten in the way of God because we wanting to be true to a text forget the people for whom the text was written to. Because we miss the point, then we forget the why for the what. Whether it's the issue of sexuality, why did God create it? What's it all about? See, we as human beings have the tendency to mix all of this up. Why? Because God gives us instruction and understanding of what his intention for humanity is. We mess that up all the time. Why does God want us to honor us with, his in, with our income? Why does God want us to give? Because he wants our lives to be blessed. He knows that money can be a very false God and own us and lead us places that ultimately don't lead to good. God wants to bless our lives. God always wants to move in our lives. But the question is, do we know who he is? Do we trust in him? And that's what Jesus came along to reveal. That he's not the one that we need to be concerned about. But the question is, do we mix it up? And here's where Jesus turned the conversation. Look at this. Following along in the story, Jesus said to, the, the, said to the Pharisees, to the leaders there, he said, you guys search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are they that bear witness of me. And yet, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. You see, you and I, the realization, who is Jesus to us? That's what my hope is through you end of it. Because Jesus couldn't have proved any greater that he's for us than what he eventually accomplished for us at the cross. John's writing this with hindsight. John's writing this realizing that all of these things continually pointed to the one who loves us more than we could ever even begin to understand. And where human beings had been mixed up, human beings had gotten in the way, where human beings had made the way to God complicated or difficult, Jesus came to clear the way. Jesus came to show that I am the way, the truth. And the life. But then look at what he says here. And this was offensive to the, to, the, to the Jewish leaders. He said, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. What you need to begin to recognize, and that's what all of us have to recognize is this. That life comes by love, not by law. And if you understand Jesus, when he realized, when Jesus waded into it, why were the religious leaders, why were the people that should know the most? And here's, here's something interesting to us. Why is it often that the people who know the most are the ones least willing to believe? Why is it the people that know the most sometimes can get in the way the most and create the most obstructions to what God's wanting to do? In the midst of it. Because we fail to realize that life is the result of love, not law. Paul coming along writing said, listen, if there was a law that could provide life, it would have been. 
The only reason God had ever given law was to try to keep human beings from getting involved with things that although tempting as they may be, would actually harm us, not help us. And how many of us in life, our greatest regrets in life, were things that we did when we violated our own conscience. When we did things because they were tempting, they seemed like they were good, they promised us the world, and in the end, they left us empty. The God who loved us was there to help us. Because Jesus put it into perspective, to know God is to recognize that God is a father. A father who loves us more than we could ever even begin to recognize or understand. And that our father knows best. That when we have a relationship with him, and that's what Jesus came to provide. See, many of us stumble and get tripped up in life. Because if all we see is God as a rule giver, maybe your conception of God has been tripped up by your past because you had nothing but lawgivers as parents. But when you can begin to recognize that God is a perfect father, embodied in Jesus, that when you see Jesus, you see God. And then anything he ever has said for us is always for our good. Following Jesus makes you better at life. Following Jesus makes our life better. And the reality is when we come to learn to live that way, that's what John said. That I have written these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that by believing, you could experience life in his name. See, believing in who he is will begin to give you the ability to trust that what he says is actually the best thing for us. But how many times have us in the church world have gotten caught up in the situation when we were so desirous to be true to a text that we actually became an inhibitor to the people the text was given to help? And that's what I want to end at this end, is that what excuses do we make not to love? What excuses do we make not to love. One of the ways the church has been so marginalized in culture today is because we've been many times on the wrong end of many of the cultural issues that our nation or that people in our communities have struggled with. I remember this most apparently to me because I've been there before and I realize the more I grow, the more sometimes I'm ashamed of where I've come from because I messed up. I didn't understand correctly. And maybe I've been a reason why. Others may have been prohibited from receiving what God had for them. But it became so real to me. Years ago, in the state of Connecticut, there was a rally that was taking place up in Hartford. And churches all across the state were gathering to meet. Because the state was going to deal with the issue of defining marriage. And so... There was many Christian communities. There were many. Our church took a busloads of people up there. A lot of churches across the area had. And there were many uh, uh, leaders in the church community speaking that day. But on the opposite side of the Capitol, there was a separate protest rally that was going on with people wearing equality badges because they were wanting marriage to be defined more than to a man and a woman on that front. And I'll never forget what happened that day because I was standing in the crowd listening I looked back and an older couple was there that day who had a poster that was very, very unkind. And I say that diplomatically because it was, I was almost ashamed to read it as a believer. But then I'll never forget that these people came across that were in the other side. They were on the opposite of the capital and they wanted to know what was going on on this other side. So they walked around and they came over and they stood right over by where I was. And they had on their, their stickers that said equality. And this older couple recognized them in the crowd, saw the sticker. And they turned to him and said, what the H-E-L-L are you doing here? And began to be more unkind than that. In that moment, I was so ashamed and embarrassed. I wanted to crawl into a hole and hide. I realized that this is my community, but is really, are we all on the same page? Do we all know the same God? Is, G, do we, is that how Jesus, is that how we conceive and perceive Jesus? To respond to people who may not 
see things the way he sees things? It was in that moment, see that we can take opportunities to make excuses why we don't need to love. But the most important thing that we need to ask ourselves as followers of Christ is do we exhibit the very life of Jesus in the way we live, in the lives that we reflect? Do we, have we misunderstood the text and gotten in the way of being the agencies of God's grace and love to our world because it was easy to make an excuse? Because there's always been lists, there's always been ways, there's always been means, and people have been hurt along the way. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, I hope today you just begin to ask yourself the question, who is Jesus to me? My following him, is his model the model that I'm exhibiting within culture? So today, I don't know where this lands with you. Here's my hope. If you need change in your life, that you would be willing to answer the question, do I want to get better? Because the Jesus of the Bible is willing to get involved in your situation. He will always provide an instruction because many times we have excuses and reasons why not to believe. And sometimes it's facing those excuses that are our biggest challenge to getting better. But maybe if you're not in a situation where you need to be better, maybe you need to be on the other end of the question. Have I been a part of a community that have created barriers to the people that God loves? Have I been a part of maybe in my own understanding, attempting to be true to a text and forget the people for whom the text was written to? Have I missed the point because I don't know the why behind the what? Because there's nothing in God's ways that will ever give us an excuse not to be compassionate or to love. So what excuses have we made not to love? I'm hoping that this message hits all of us in this moment, especially with all that our nation is facing right now. How will we, the church, respond? How will we, the church, stand up in the midst of this? I want to remind our church of this truth. That when the church began, the believers, the followers of Jesus responded to crisis within the community. In the first century, when a plague attempted to create so much havoc and fear and uncertainty among the Roman Empire, it was the Christian community that stood up and cared for people that they didn't even know. Why? Because they recognized that every single human being bore the image of God. And they were owed the dignity and love that the God of heaven sent to them through his one and only son. Second century, the same. And the church grew in those times. And that's what my heart is, is that even in the midst of crisis, what our enemy has meant for evil, that God will turn this, that the church will arise and shine, that we will lead the way, we will be the hands of compassion and the objects of grace to a community that is dealing with fear and uncertainty, that in our own sense of peace, in our own sense of assurance, that we trust in the God who loves us and has made it crystal clear because his one and only son took our sin, our unrighteousness to the cross to not just bring forgiveness, but healing and peace to a world desperately in need. We should remember where we've all come from. And this is the time, church family, to arise. This is the time to be the church. It's not about a building that we meet in, but it's about responding to the challenges of our times. It's about being the hands and feet of Jesus to a community that's desperately in need. May we be the people of peace, May we be the people of sensibility. We may be the people of grace who ministers to the needs of our community in a time such as this.